Okay, so now we have a stand-in speaker, Eric, who will try not to sell you too many 3D things. <laughs> um, he's going to talk about the... I don't, actually, I don't know what he's going to talk about, the center for... Yeah, uh, I, was, I was asked to fill in for a speaker who wasn't able to attend yep. uh, just about 40 minutes ago. Yep. Uh, I have a PowerPoint that I just built on my phone. Amazingly, he can do it. <laughs> and uh, uh, you will need 3D glasses. I actually have some 3D in this presentation. Um, we're not going to start with 3D, though. We're going to start with uh, a little bit of 2D, uh, a little bit of background. Uh, my name is Eric Kurland. I founded a nonprofit uh, organization called 3D Space, the Center for Stereoscopic Photography, Art, Cinema, and Education. Uh, it is uh, a nonprofit dedicated to the art, science, and history of stereoscopic 3D, uh, everything from the origins in the uh, late 1830s to the latest virtual reality technologies and all of the 3D movies, comic books, uh, auto stereo displays, everything that has come in between in the last 175 or so years. Um, about a year and a half ago, 3D Space opened a museum in uh, Los Angeles. And last year, I was invited to give a presentation on how the museum opened. I'm happy to report that the doors are still open. And I uh, uh, would like to give you a little look at the museum. So I am going to play a very short video clip here. Down this side alley, past the murals of Viewmasters and 3D glasses, you'll find a true hidden gem called 3D Space. We affectionately call it the bunker because it's underneath the Echo Park Film Center. The public is aware of 3D. You know, we've, we've had lots of 3D movies, but 3D is so much more than that. A British scientist in 1838 uh, named Sir Charles Wheatstone, surmising that because our eyes are set slightly apart, uh, we see two different views of the world. Build a device called the stereoscope. Early photographers learned they could shoot a photo, move the camera slightly to the right, shoot a second, stick it in a stereoscope, and see 3D. Up until the early 20th century, stereoscopes were the, the main way of, of entertaining at home. So being able to educate people on the art, science, and history of everything that we see stereoscopically, that's why I started 3D Space. And this little museum has a pretty big advisory board member. Uh, Brian May from the band Queen oh, is, is a huge fan of 3D. Brian has a publishing company called the London Stereoscopic Company, and he's published a whole bunch of books on 3D history subjects. In fact, he has a, a, one of the largest collections of Victorian era 3D. Uh, these are Diableries. These are uh, uh, stereo cards from the 1860s and 1870s uh, produced in Paris that depict scenes in hell with skeletons and demons. Amazing. Brian May also produced a short animated 3D film based on his Diablerie cards called One Night in Hell. This is so <laughs> amazing. And a virtual Queen concert called VR the Champions that you can request to watch during your tour. For every two to three months, I have a brand new exhibit uh, from our museum collection. The current exhibit is uh, a display of lenticulars, holograms, and auto stereoscopic displays. That's all 3D that you don't need glasses to look at. Nosferatu is cracking me up over oh, here. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, these are uh, 3D monster portraits. They're lenticular photos by uh, photographer Michael Brown. These are called multiplex holograms. It's a process that was invented in the 1970s, and these are actually holograms of movies. So they would shoot an actor on a, a large rotating turntable. We have several really cool hand-etched holograms done by an artist named Tristan Duke, who's also based here in LA. These were commissioned uh, by Disney. This is actually the, uh, the soundtrack LP for The Force Awakens. So you can go out and get this record and uh, uh, you know, have these holograms in your home. 3D Space also features some of the latest in 3D technology, like this lenticular screen called the Looking Glass. What's really cool about this is uh, you can attach uh, a tracking sensor and then Whoa. you can use your hand to actually interact with what's being rendered on the screen. And check this guy out. He's interactive too. Really? Yeah. I love a virtual pet, yes. So cute. 
I will call him Herbert and he will be my <laughs> frog. I can totally see why you're obsessed with 3D. It's kind of the coolest thing ever. So that was a segment that aired on the Los Angeles ABC affiliate on a program called Eye on LA. Uh, they've been running that periodically every couple of months, and it's been great uh, having people come to the museum. Uh, now that was the exhibit that we had on display at the beginning of 2019. In mid-2019, uh, we introduced a new exhibit to the space called Not Just a Kid's Toy on the 80-year history of the Viewmaster uh, from 1939 to the present. In the exhibit, uh, we have a number of Viewmasters on display, and people are invited to come down and uh, uh, take a look at vintage views, new views. Uh, we've even created some new uh, Viewmaster reels from digital stereo pairs uh, using the company Image 3D based in Portland. Uh, and I have that viewer with me. I'll have it at the demonstration session tonight if you'd like to see it. Um, something else that we have uh, embarked on, um, uh, uh, Alicia Benoit sponsored a, an initiative uh, to launch National 3D Day. This will be a, a, a day uh, that everyone in the worldwide 3D community can promote and celebrate 3D to the world. Um, it will take place on the third day of the third week of the third month. That means that this year it is Tuesday, March 17th. So when you celebrate St. Patrick's Day, you can also celebrate 3D. Uh, you can talk to Alicia or myself at any point to get more information about things that you can do to promote 3D yourself. Um, and uh, this is probably a good time to put on your 3D glasses and we will switch over. Uh, something else that I've been doing to help promote the history of 3D, uh, I've been working with the estate of silent filmmaker Harold Lloyd. Uh, he was an avid stereo realist photographer from 1947 until 1971, uh, took over 250,000 3D photos, and I've been privileged to work with Suzanne Lloyd, Harold's granddaughter, to put together programs of Harold's material. Uh, what I'm going to show you here is a piece that we recorded that's going to be released on the 3D Rarities 2 Blu-ray coming out next month. So we can roll that. Hi, I'm Suzanne Lloyd, and I am so honored to be able to present my grandfather Harold Lloyd's fabulous 3D stereo slides. These are accumulation of a library that he shot between 1947 and 1971, and he shot a little over 200,000 photographs on Kodachrome. So let's start this adventure. Here we have Harold with a stereo realist camera on a tripod, and obviously he's in Tennessee. Russ Meyer, Harold's dear friend, gave him a stereo realist camera in 1947 and said, hey, why don't you take this camera, Harold, and start shooting around your home, which was, as we see here, Green Acres. And of course, he's playing with a light meter. And his favorite model was my grandmother, who, was also his leading lady in his films, Mildred Davis. And here's someone that I know quite well, because that's me. And I was his next model. His third favorite model at Green Acres would be one of our beloved pets. Here's Harold with his Cocker Spaniel, Nicky. He doesn't look too happy in this photograph. I thought maybe you'd enjoy seeing, as we fondly called it at the house, his chaos room. And this is where Harold kept and edited and produced his 3D shows. And this was a very magical place for him because he could relive all his adventures and travels and family affairs by putting his slides on a light board or looking at them through a viewer. Well, Harold loved beautiful women, and he was asked a lot of the times to judge beauty pageants. And this beauty pageant was taken down at Venice Beach in the early 50s. And while you're at the beach, why not go to the seashore and find a gorgeous mermaid? This beautiful girl was part of a collection 
of nudes that Harold shot. And most of the models were Playboy bunnies. This was shot at Paradise Beach in Malibu, California. Well, travels around the world begin with Harold here in Sao Paulo de Vance. And I was very privileged to be able to travel with him, along with my little poodle, Pepper. Harold had a great eye for the look, the symmetry, and the complete composition of a film. And the special part about this little picture is I love in the right-hand corner is the Kodak sign for selling Kodak film. Harold loved looking at people and the reality of places. And this shot is one of my favorites because it's like the gondoliers in, in Venice, just having a day of waiting for the tourists and having a few tales of their own to be said right by their gondolas. The Café Society in Paris never looked better. This was shot down the Champs-Élysées in 1958. And the Café Fourcroix is still there with the vibrant canopies in scarlet red. Harold was intrigued with people's faces. And this gentleman that he shot at the Acropolis in Greece really tells us of a very interesting and hearty life. This is Giza in the Egyptian desert, a wonderful shot of the pyramids, with a very happy camel who seems to just love his owner, and a very handsome-looking Arab, a young Omar Sharif on the deserts. Another study of what Harold loved about looking at people. Three little children in the streets of Hong Kong in the early 60s. They obviously look like they're just coming back from school and Harold ran into them right on the street. But such a capture of youth at that time. This is a boat person from Bangkok who's working the rivers as his trade. Harold loved going out into the fields or up into the mountains or going anywhere where he could pick up rural shots and true shots of homelands of all different countries. This is a lovely shot in Monument Valley with the sweetest little girl holding her little lamb and the flock with her mother looking on. This is such a beautiful, true spirit of Americana. Well, when you're a movie star known for doing films on high buildings and out on ledges, you have to jump into the picture now and then. And here's Harold overlooking the Grand Canyon, taking a big chance. And because Harold was a celebrity, he had some different celebrity friends he used to just hang with. And then one of his dearest friends is here is Sterling Holloway. And they're at the L.A. Open at the Riviera Golf Course in Pacific Palisades in California. Well, cheers to everyone. And this happens to be Harold as father of the bride. And he has just given away his eldest daughter, Gloria, who happens to be my mom. And this is at her wedding in September of 1950. And, of course, the lady in the magnificent hat is the columnist had a hopper, and the beautiful redhead beside Harold is Frances Marion, the very famous Oscar-winning screenwriter and director. And they were very dear friends of our family. Another celebrity who was an avid 3D photographer was Dick Powell. And this photograph happened that Dick was doing a I believe the Canadian Mounties and had his camera on the set and Harold came over to see him and of course he brought his camera. The only one in this group didn't have a camera I think was that gorgeous horse. Well two funny guys write together as brothers and comrade in arms. It's Bob and Harold and if you can see down in your left hand side of the photograph Harold does have his camera in his hand and someone took the shot of them. 
but I had to include it because those are two comic geniuses together. Harold loved roaming around on movie sets, and uh, he was invited to go on to the set of The Robe over at 20th Century Fox, and here's a shot of Richard Burton doing a scene. Well, we're back to the Glamour Girls, and we have one that certainly made an incredible name for herself. She was a lovely woman. Her name was Jane Mansfield, and she is just gorgeous. And Harold has some beautiful shots of her. Magnificent. Here's President Eisenhower with his lovely wife, the First Lady, Mamie Eisenhower. And President Dwight D. Eisenhower happened to be a big stereo realist, enthusiast himself. And he and Harold were good friends, and they used to get together and talk about their photography. This was taken at the Rose Bowl in Pasadena on New Year's Day after the president had just been the grand marshal of the parade. Oh, we love this jolly, wonderful fellow. And he is a fellow comedian to Harold and also a fellow Shriner. And uh, they had a lot in common, Red Skelton and Harold. And he actually was a 3D enthusiast, too, and had a 3D camera, along with being a fabulous artist. The ultimate in the gorgeous blondes, Marilyn Monroe. The shot was taken at Green Acres in the spring of 1953. It was done for a military training film to be shown to the troops in the South Pacific during the testing of the hydrogen bomb. And in this training film, Marilyn asked the troops to please be very careful and not say anything to their family or friends. And she keeps repeating, I hate careless men. This was done undercover at Green Acres. It was photographed by the Lookout Mountain Laboratories, which was run by the government to do military films. And Marilyn and Harold were both very involved in this project and uh, worked on it together. Harold and Marilyn had formed quite a sweet friendship. And the second time he went to shoot her, she was quite surprised when he showed up because the photo shoot was being done by Philippe Halsman, who was a very dear friend of Harold's. And he knew that Harold would love to come and shoot her and shadow his photography of her, which was put on the cover of Life magazine in black and white. So this photograph shows you Marilyn in 3D and in color. And now, this final photograph is not in 3D. It's actually a photo of Harold doing an advertisement for the Stereo Realist camera. He was their spokesman for a number of years. And as he sits proudly in his library at Green Acres with his camera and his file box of photographs and also his 3D viewer, and he was so proud to be able to represent this product and also to use it to shoot the world and all the lovely people in it. So I hope you enjoyed that. Um, my time is short, but I have one last thing I'd like to show you. It's very quick. Um, I would... Uh, uh, I'd like to tell you about a very recent project that uh, it has uh, been underway. Uh, I've been invited by the conservation department at the Getty Center uh, into their radiology lab to determine how we can do stereoscopic x-rays of uh, sculptures and other uh, pieces in the museum collection. Uh, so first off, I'd like to thank uh, the people from the Getty Center uh, who invited me there, and in particular, Todd Swanson, who's here in the room and has given me permission to show you these x-rays. Uh, so what I'm about to show you is a piece of, of uh, plaster sculpture uh, that in the radiology lab at the Getty, it was placed on a computer-controlled turntable, and uh, x-rays were taken at five-degree intervals. Uh, I've done a frame offset to create stereo pairs from it, and if you put on your 3D glasses, let's take a look at a 3D x-ray of a sculpture. So this was actually uh, imaged in two sections, the lower section and the upper section. Um, I stitched the uh, uh, lower and uppers together, and uh, as I said, 
just took sequential images to create the stereo pairs. Uh, what we really like about this is it allows the conservators at the museum to be able to see the internal structures uh, in depth and determine uh, actual uh, construction techniques and uh, um, uh, hopefully we'll get to continue doing this with more pieces from the museum. Um, and uh, that concludes my talk. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope you enjoyed my little improvisation.